Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. We are still, let me remind you, in that main section of the epistle, which demonstrates the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ over the angels. That passage began at chapter 1 and verse 5. It is part, of course, of the whole theme of the epistle to the Hebrews, which is concerned to set forth the surpassing glory and wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the epistle's great aim, to exalt the Lord Jesus in his supreme and unique glory and greatness. And in order to do so, the writer of the epistle compares him to various different other areas of creation, to the angel creation in chapter 1 from verse 5 to the end, to Moses, for example, in chapter 3, then later on to Aaron, and all the time he is setting forth Jesus in all his greatness. The passage from chapter 1, verse 5 to the end at verse 14 is setting out the evidence of Scripture for the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ in these seven quotations from Scripture, mostly, almost all, from the Psalms. And then chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, is a passage where we have a pause for one of the solemn warning passages that you find in the Epistle to the Hebrews. It's a word we found at the beginning of exhortation. And the writer mixes this exhortation with warnings against the danger of not treating seriously the word of God which he has been expounding. And from verse 5 of chapter 2, he returns to this main theme of this section, the superiority of Jesus to the angels. For it was not to angels, verse 5, that God subjected the world to come. Now here he is really dealing with the problem, as we found last time, great problem to the Jew, of how Jesus could be superior to the angels and yet become man in the truest and deepest sense and suffer and die because the angels were a superior order of creation. And yet how could Jesus be superior to them and yet become man and suffer and die. And in answer to that, the writer of the epistle expounds the full significance of the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, why it was necessary that he should be fully and truly and completely man. Now, once again, I think it's important to emphasize that the real thrust of both chapters 1 and 2 is not on the subject of angels. This is why he is not simply dealing with something that's of importance to the Jews who were bothered about angels. The real thrust of this passage is on the Lord Jesus Christ, his glory as very God of very God in chapter 1. He is not an angel. To which of the angels did he say at any time, Thou art my son? And the great theme of chapter 1 is the supreme glory of the Lord Jesus Christ as very God of very God. Now in chapter 2, he deals with the supreme significance of that same Jesus becoming fully man with us men. And so the theme of chapter 2 is the full humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now do you see how he exalts Jesus in his dual nature as fully and utterly God and truly and absolutely man. And he does this in chapter 2 again by showing us from the scripture that God has a purpose and destiny for man far superior to that of the angels. So we have two pictures in verses 5 to 9, and we looked at these last time. Man as God made him, and again he demonstrates it from Scripture. Do you notice, may I repeat it again, all the time the 
body of his teaching is the scriptures. He's returning them to the scriptures again and again. And he has this picture first of man as God made him. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou carest for him? A quotation, of course, from Psalm 8. Thou didst make him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. That is man as God made him, crowned with glory and honor, intended to be the Lord of creation. The one who had dominion over all that God made. That's the picture that you get of man as God created him in Genesis 1 and 2. But then you get the picture of man as sin spoiled him. And the picture of man as sin spoiled him is in that little phrase, as it is at the end of verse 8. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. And this is the tragedy of man as sin spoiled him, that nothing is really under his dominion as it ought to be, that man far from being the glorious figure that God has made is a tragic ruin, unable particularly to control himself. Now the answer to this tragedy of man is found in the man, Christ Jesus. What is God doing about this tragedy that there is, that he sets over against the picture of man as God made him, man as sin spoiled him? He says that the answer to the tragedy is the man, Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. And then verse 9, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. He became man, and what we see in the man Christ Jesus is God's glorious answer to the tragedy of man spoiled by sin. Now we turn this evening to this passage beginning at chapter 2, verse 10, where the apostle elaborates this picture of Jesus, the Son of God, become man for our salvation. And the point of it really, the point of the whole of this passage is that God's eternal purpose remains the same. God has never abrogated his purpose to make man crowned with glory and honor. He intends to restore man to the glory of which sin has robbed him. And God has held on to that purpose, if you like to bring man to the place of dominion. And this is precisely what he does in Jesus Christ. This is why the great hope, you see, that rings through this epistle is centered in Jesus. All that God means man to become that sin has robbed him of, he may become again in Jesus Christ. And the picture of the man Christ Jesus is the picture of the one who is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every man. Now it is in the crowned, exalted, glorified man Christ Jesus that we are to look and say, that is what one day I shall become. By God's grace. He has not forfeited his purpose. Now this dominion which is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And which we shall share with him. When we shall reign with him. This dominion you can see breaking through his earthly ministry. Have you noticed? Wherever our Lord Jesus went in the world. It seemed as if everything bowed before him. Men caught their breath and they said, even the winds and the waves obey him. The wind was at his command. The waves stilled at his word. Sickness disappeared at his voice. Death was banished by his call, Lazarus come forth. And our Lord Jesus strode through the world with dominion, that was the great characteristic of his ministry. And do you see that he who is the forerunner, as the authorized version says, and for those of you of the authorized version, let me encourage you by saying, I think it's much better here than the RSV. The RSV is not really very good 
here. I read it this evening simply for the sake of consistency. But it's better in the authorized version. The forerunner for us has entered in. The pioneer, he says, of their salvation. That's what verse 10 is about. It was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory. Now that's what God is doing just now, you see. Do you wonder what God is doing now in the world and in the church? He is bringing many sons to glory. The glory they lost by the rebellion at the fall. That's what he is engaged in doing. He is not just engaged in swelling church roles or in bringing people into church or even bringing them under the sound of the word. He is engaged in bringing them to glory. And that's what he's doing in your life, beloved, this evening. He is taking you on to that glorious climax which is in the heart of God from before the foundation of the world and he's going to do it. And the doing of it centers in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the finished product, if you like. He is the pioneer who has before entered in for us. Now this is the glorious message of this epistle at this point. Even the demon world, you see, he's going to tell us about how Satan was deprived of his power by the same work of grace in Jesus Christ. And even the demon world trembled at the presence of Jesus when he ministered on earth. Have you ever noticed, for instance, that interesting little touch at the, the maniac of Gadara's healing when the Demons come to Jesus and apply for permission to go somewhere else. Don't send us there, they said. Send us there. You know, send us into the swine. They're applying. They, they recognize if no one else in the universe recognizes. Here is the Lord of all creation. Things in heaven and earth and under the earth are under his foot. And it is that that is the great guarantee that God means to go on. And complete this work of grace in you, no matter who we are, no matter how poor we may feel, no matter how ordinary, God means to make you glorious yet. Now that's the true glory that God gave to men. But you'll notice the phrase in verse 10 that the ultimate key to the universe is really not the glory of man the ultimate key to the universe is it is the key to life. And if you want the key to life, you know, here it is in verse 10. It's in just five words. For whom and by whom all things exist. For whom and by whom all things exist. The whole universe exists by him, that is by God. And it is God who has this purpose in view, you see. But ultimately the key to the universe is found in him from whom it has all come. There's a favorite sub-theme of the epistle to the Hebrews, this. It has all come from him and it is all going to him. It exists for him. And that I say to you again this evening, that's the key to the universe and the key to life. It's the key to understanding what's going to happen in the universe, where it come from, came from and where it's going to. And it's the key to life because this is what life is all about, from him and for him. You know you could summarize life in these five words. From him, everything that is good and blessed is from him. And everything is for him. Now it is that God from whom and for whom all things exist who is bringing many sons to glory. And he is making the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting. It was fitting. 
Now you will notice this phrase, the dilemma you see is that the world is meant to be subject to man, but man himself is subject to sin, and death we do not yet see everything put under his feet. Man is in fact in bondage, as verse 15 tells us, he came to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. So man who was meant to be in dominion over the world is himself in dominion to sin and death. Well, now what is to be done? Well, Jesus came in order to deliver us from both of these dominions. That's what he is going on now to say. From sin by making propitiation for sin, verse 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in every respect so that he might become a a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, the word should be, as I'll be explaining later, for the sins of the people. He came to deliver us from death by destroying him who had the power of death That is the devil in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death. That is the devil. Now it is fitting, says the writer of the epistle at the beginning of verse 10, that Jesus should be made the perfect savior through suffering for two main reasons. If you wondered why it is fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Why? Well, first of all, because this glory to which he is restoring man is a glory man lost through sin. And the taking away of sin means bearing it bearing its guilt and judgment and penalty and defilement and pollution. And it is that suffering that the pioneer of our salvation had to undergo in order to bring many sons to glory. They had lost their glory through through sin. Sin could only be taken away through the suffering which was the expiation of our guilt and pollution. And so he brought many sons to glory through suffering and thereby became the perfect Savior. But also, Jesus was made the perfect Savior through suffering for the very reason verse 18 explains. Because he himself has suffered and been tested, he is able to help those who are tested. In bringing many sons to glory, do you see, our Lord Jesus seeks to minister to them, to help them. And in order to help them through this veil of tears and suffering into glory, he himself suffered so that he might save to the uttermost those who come to God by him. Now from verse 11 to the beginning of verse 14, the apostle demonstrates how to become such a savior. Jesus became our brother. Did you notice that beautiful phrase? Let me explain what it is that he is saying. He was not ashamed, verse 11, to call them brethren. And you get the phrase repeated in verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in every respect. In order to become that perfect Savior, he not only left heaven's glory, He became our brother. The problem of sin, you see, had to be dealt with, not outside of man, but in man. 
because for the very simple reason that man was the offender and if sin this sin which had caused man to be robbed of his glory which had brought him under its dominion and power and made him an heir not of eternal life but of eternal death this sin had to be dealt with and judged in man who was the sinner for example it was not angels that it had to be dealt with amongst it was in man that it had to be dealt with because man was the sinner and it could not be dealt with apart from man so the great need of man as a sinner was that from humanity there might rise up one who would be able to take upon himself what sin brought that is the judgment and the condemnation and the guilt and to bear it but you see no man could bear that judgment even for himself and live no man could do other than be crushed under the weight of the judgment and condemnation that sin brought and this is precisely the necessity of Christ's incarnation now it's important for us to grasp this and it's something I think we don't think about enough that there is a fundamental reason why Jesus had to become man why it was not enough merely for him to swoop from the heavens and save us but that he should become man in order to save us now why did he need to become man why is the incarnation a vital part of our redemption and at Christmas time we sing glorious music and glorious words about Christ having been born to give a second birth but why is it necessary for him to be born as man and why does the New Testament labor this doctrine well it is for this reason you see that sin has to be dealt with in man and Christ comes to enter into our humanity to brother us in our adversity as John Owen puts it so beautiful he became a brother in adversity to us he drew near to us and took upon him our nature entered our humanity in order that he might do what no man could do and that was to bear our sin and to take our judgment and to raise us up out of our condemnation so we sang this evening oh generous love that he who smote in man for man the foe the double agony in man for man should undergo now this is the real mystery you see of Christ become flesh he had to become a real man in order as man to bear the judgment of man's sin and in verse 11 the apostle says he who sanctifies and here and in most parts of Hebrews the word sanctifies really means to bring salvation to it doesn't have the same restricted sense that sanctify has in Paul's epistles for example where generally sanctification speaks of making holy separating unto God here it rather speaks and I'm sure those interpreters are right to take it this way it speaks of that whole range of salvation from our regeneration to our glorification and here in verse 11 he says he who sanctifies that is the Christ who saves and those who are sanctified have all one origin now by that he means they all are 
men. They have come from human stock. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified of all one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, in verses 12 and 13, the apostle quotes three scripture passages to press this home. All of them passages with a messianic note. For example, Psalm 22, from which verse 12 comes, is, as you know, the psalm which has the cry of dereliction in it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in these passages, the great emphasis is on the solidarity of the Messiah with his people. Precisely this emphasis of how he has brothered us in our need. Now you can see the picture of a whole humanity aching with all that sin has done and yet nowhere is there a glimmer of hope that any man can do anything about this situation. All he can wait for with a sense of awful hopelessness and despair is the judgment that his sin rightly deserves and then, then in Bethlehem a star shines and the angels sing Glory to God in the highest because hope has dawned in the coming of Jesus Christ. A man child is born. That's the cry you see. And from humanity there has come this one who has brothered his people in their adversity. Now in Psalm 22, that is what the psalmist is saying. I will proclaim thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. Now the other two examples, and we don't have time to uh, go into detail on them, but the other two examples come both from Isaiah chapter 8, one from verse 17 and the other from verse 18. Verse 17, I will put my trust in him, is the, the quotation that verse 13 gives us. Psalm 22 is fairly easy to understand, isn't it? That here is the Messiah proclaiming his name, the name of God as Savior to my brethren. And he is speaking about Jesus brothering us in our affliction and adversity. But Isaiah 8, 17 is not quite so easy to understand. I will put my trust in him. Now, that's a good example, I think, of a very important fact which we need to learn. And that is that frequently, especially in this epistle and frequently also in the New Testament elsewhere, when the Old Testament is being quoted, it's not just the words that are quoted which are intended, but the whole context. And I'm sure that F.F. F. Bruce, Professor F.F. F. Bruce, who's recently retired from the Chair of Biblical Studies in Sheffield, you know, is right when he says that this is an example of that great principle that runs through Scripture, which we need to grasp in understanding it, that the whole of the context is carried with the quotation. Now that really is an important thing if you are to understand how the New Testament uses the old. I will put my trust in him, but it's the whole context that's carried. And in Isaiah 8, a good thing for you to uh, read it when you go home, the prophet speaks in this passage of God hiding his face, you see, from the house of Jacob, and Isaiah waiting and trusting in God, and with him, and with the Messiah who is pictured here is the righteous remnant. And this is the picture of the Son of God and his brethren. They are waiting, trusting in God. And Jesus has come, as it were, to sit where they sit, one of Isaiah's phrases, to sit where they sit in order that together with them he might wait for the salvation of God. Now that's the context, you see, and I say again, it's the whole context which is carried. The same is true in Isaiah 8, 18, which is quoted at the end of verse 13. And again, here am I, and the children God has given me. Now that quotation, which is a quotation from Isaiah, and you'll, uh, Isaiah's lips, I mean, 
And Isaiah, you know, is speaking about his own children. Do you remember these children who had such dreadful names? Shear Jashub, is it not? One of them. And the other one, Mahershalal Hashbaz. How would you like to have been called Mahershalal Hashbaz? But both the names meant something really significant. They were the children God had given to Isaiah, and they had hope set in their very names for the future, you see. The hope of deliverance was here in the name. And Isaiah says, Here am I and the children thou hast given me. Now this is applied messianically to our Lord Jesus Christ, whose people are spoken of now not just as his brethren, but as his children. And it's very significant that in John 17, for example, our Lord Jesus refers to his people as the children thou hast given me. This is used in the New Testament, you see, as a picture of Jesus and the solidarity he has with his own people. He has come down to be a brother to them in adversity. But Jesus speaks to the Father in John 17. Do you know in that beautiful figure, thou hast given them to me. His people are the Father's love gift to the Lord Jesus. And they are his. He identifies himself with them. And it is this identification of himself with us, which is the essence of what the uh, writer of Hebrews is telling us about here. Now notice how he goes on in verse 14. Since therefore, having demonstrated this from Scripture, and I commend to you again a study of the way the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews uses the Old Testament. Great chunks of it. That's the important thing. Not just little texts here and there. Not a little verse but great chunks of it. And he says, there is where you learn about the Messiah. There is where you learn about salvation. There is where you learn about our brother who was born to be our brother in adversity. And after these quotations, he then goes on, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature he partook of the same nature. Verse 17 underlines the same thing again. In verse 16 he says, Surely it is not with angels that he is concerned. Now the RSV says he is concerned. The authorized version says it was not the nature of angels that he took upon himself. And I was interested to see that... Um, Dr. Philip Hughes, whose commentary in Hebrews I've been commending to you, uh, says he thinks the authorized version's translation is better. I was interested in that because... No, that's going to sound arrogant, but... Um, I was interested in it anyway. And I'll leave you to guess why. Just in case you go on thinking about that and don't listen to the rest. That's what I had thought before I read what he was saying. But um, this... This is an important thing he is saying in verse 16. It is not, with, not the nature of angels he took. He didn't take the nature of an angel when he came. Some of them thought he had. They said, it is an angel, but it wasn't an angel. Does an angel, said Jesus, eat like this? He had the nature of a man. He was the man Christ Jesus. And he did not take the nature of angels. He took the nature of the descendants of Abraham. Why the descendants of Abraham? Because that's the people to whom God made the promise. This is where God promised that he was going to deal with these very people. The descendants of Abraham after the flesh. And that's why when you find the birth of Jesus described at the beginning of the Gospels, it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. And it is the children of Abraham whose nature he has taken and come into the, come into the world to be made like them. Verse 17, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. He became, he became, he became. 
You notice how the Apostle Paul puts it, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And the New Testament is so accurate in its words. It does not say he came in the likeness of flesh, nor that he came in sinful flesh, but he came in real flesh. Jesus was a real man experiencing all the emotional and all the sensible needs of real men. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin that in his flesh he might bear the sins of many. He had to be made like his brethren. Now, beloved, let me summarize what the apostle is saying in these verses in several words for you. Key words of Jesus coming. Because he came not only as very God of very God, because only God could deal with the problem of man's sin, he became truly man with us men. And the apostle has several things to say. He speaks of his humiliation, first of all. He was not ashamed, verse 11 at the end, to call them brethren. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified of all one origin, that's why he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Since the children share in flesh and blood, verse 14, he himself likewise partook of the same nature. Now that is Jesus' humiliation. And if we had grasped this, this would send us into worship and wonder. This is where the Lord Jesus is exalted in great glory here. That he has come to humble himself, to take our nature. Do you ever think of this at Christmas time? The sheer mystery that he who wears the crown and glory of the Godhead should have humbled himself to become man with us men. Humiliation. Identification is the second thing. He became like his brethren, verse 17, in every respect. There is no area where he did not become like us, sin apart. In every area of our life, in all our testings, in all our burdens, in all our sorrows, in all the aches and anguish of our heart, in all the emptiness that man in the flesh knows, he entered into it all. Now I tell you the mind boggles at the very idea, but we may simply say that there is not one area throughout all your earthly pilgrimage where you will ever plant your feet. But Jesus has stepped there before you. Never a place that you will touch in your life, but Jesus has been there. No earthly joy that he doesn't understand and enter into and share with you. Now that's a beautiful thing because we always think it's just our sorrows that he shares. No earthly joy that he hasn't entered into and is not able to touch with a glory that the world has never seen. No earthly sorrow or burden that he has not experienced. He became like his brethren in every respect. Humiliation and identification. The other is propitiation or substitution. He became that so that, verse 17, he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make expiation for the sins of the people. Now, only God could have done this. But you see, the difference between propitiation and expiation is this. Expiation is simply the purging away of sin. It is always spoken of in relation to sin. Propitiation is always spoken of in relation to God. Now here's the reason. The ultimate problem that sin poses is not what sin does to me, 
or in me or to other people, although it does so much to me and to other people. The ultimate problem that sin poses is what sin does to God. And therefore the ultimate need of man is that he might find a way of propitiating the wrath of God that is turning it away. Now the reason Jesus became man and took our nature and bore our sin in his own body on the tree was that the wrath and judgment of a holy God might be turned upon him. Fourth word, destruction. He destroyed him who has the power of death. That is the devil. That through death, verse 14, he might destroy him who has the power of death. Now that word destroy really means to deprive of his power. And that is what Jesus did to the devil. Not to annihilate him because he is still there, as we well know. But to deprive him of his power. And this he has done. He has dealt, you see, with death. By dealing with its sting. The sting of death is sin. And Jesus has dealt with death by dealing with its sting. He has drawn the sting of death. So that what God's people experience is not what death is in its horror as the wages of sin. Calvin beautifully says, that God has taken death, which in Satan's hands is a gateway into hell, and he has transformed it into a gateway into glory. He has drawn the sting of death, and he has delivered his people, and that's the next word, deliverance. He has delivered those who through fear of death, verse 15, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There is a deliverance that Christ has come to bring to, not merely to take away the fear of death, but to bring present deliverance to us from all the thraldom of sin and death. And finally, compassion, verse 18. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Let me finish with this. When our Lord Jesus came into this world and took human nature upon him and bore our sin and suffered the righteous judgment of God and knew what it was to be shut out of his Father's presence in order that he might enter into death and by death Slay death, he death by dying slew, says the hymn. When he did all this, when he delivered us from the bondage that sin and death and Satan brought, he then set about taking us on to glory and between grace and glory, he seeks to be the perfect high priest and savior for his people. The one who understands, who enters into their deepest sorrows, who grasps every pang that rends the heart and is able to draw us to himself and to say, I understand it, I know it. There is nothing, there is nothing ever in this whole wide world, however high you are risen in glory and joy or however low you sink in despair and anguish, there is nothing. That Jesus has not borne before you. And that's why there's not a friend. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Who would exchange such a gospel? for anything else in the universe. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, crowned and exalted now, we worship thee. 
We worship thee, very God of very God, begotten, not created. We worship thee, the King of glory and the Lord of lords. We worship thee as the one who came and took our nature and was made like unto us. And when we were without God and without hope in the world, orphaned in our agony, thou didst brother us and bear our sin and bring us hope and salvation and glory by thy death and rising. We worship thee. Pray that more and more we may cast our trust in thee and look to thee, saying one to the other, Brethren beloved, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, even Jesus Christ. Consider him. And in considering him, may we be greatly enriched and blessed and strengthened. And to thy name we shall give all the glory and praise this night and forevermore. Amen. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.